title of the lesson today is The Dream. Let's turn to Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. And it was said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. And the church said, Amen. What a great psalm. This is the song that was sung when the exiles came back from Babylon and climbed up the mountain all the way to Jerusalem, to Zion. And this was their dream. This was their hope to return to a Zion rebuilt for the glory of of God. You know, one of the things that stands here is the line, we were like men who dreamed. You know, people that are living their dream are excited and fired up people. And yet we live in a time when people have largely forgotten how to dream. You know, the greatest dreamer of all time had to be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He believed that his life could change the whole world. And in fact, his dream became a reality. Over the next several weeks, I believe that we're going to be going through a series of studies that I think are going to help us have the dream in our hearts that Jesus had. What we're going to be doing is calling a little bit of an audible in the first principles class. In a couple of weeks, we're going to start preaching the book of Acts here in our Sunday morning. And so we'll have the overview of the book of Acts for four Sundays. And then after that, we'll be going into the book of Luke as a gospel study at the end of the year and then into the beginning of the year. And I think that will really focus on in on the ministry of Jesus. One of the things that I've been doing is just really getting into the Gospels and wrestling with the fundamental question, how did Jesus do it? And I, you know, I'm going to share some scriptures with you today that I know you've read a hundred times, but maybe like me, you didn't quite fully appreciate. Let's go to the book of John right now. I'm very excited about this message. Come on, brother. Jesus' dream was to change the world. First point, his beginning impact. In John 1, beginning in verse 26, John the Baptist says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself didn't know him, but the reason I came baptized with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify. This is the Son of God. Doesn't that send a tingle down your spine? Now, what I didn't catch in this passage is the setting. Just a very casual map. A lot of us, I think, now are familiar with Israel from our study of the Old Testament. But we know that Jerusalem lies in the southern part in the region of the tribe of Judah. If you go east, you're going to bump into the Jordan River. Well, Bethany, this particular Bethany, lies just across the Jordan. Number one, I didn't know that's where John the Baptist's ministry was at. was on the other side of the Jordan. Secondly, to get you kind of familiar with the setting, Jerusalem lies about 75 miles from Galilee. So Jesus is baptized 
a way far ways away from where he was raised. So the setting right here is John the Baptist's ministry. He clearly identifies Jesus as the Son of God because of his baptism, because the Holy Spirit came down in bodily form as a dove. And John says, I know for sure he is the Messiah. Now watch this. Verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Now this is John the Baptist with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, well, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you'll see. So they went and saw he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which when translated as Peter, is rocky. Amen, guys? <laughs> Now right here we find that John the Baptist is the next day after Jesus' baptism. And all of a sudden Jesus walks by and he's got, John the Baptist has two of his disciples with him. Well obvious, the first disciple there has to be Andrew. And since it's an eyewitness account, the other disciple has to be the future apostle John who's writing this account, amen? So there they are standing with John the Baptist. He goes, look, the Lamb of God. And they were, they were mesmerized. Why? Because they'd come out to hear the preaching of the prophet John, and it was all about the messianic coming. And here John the Baptist is saying, Hey, there he is! And just kind of like us with celebrities, we just kind of want to follow like along and pretend like no one sees us, you know what I mean? We're like incognito. So two guys were kind of trailing Jesus a little bit, and Jesus kind of sensing turns around and says, what do you want? And they kind of stammer around a little bit and they really come up with a deep question. Uh, Lord, uh, where are you staying? <laughs> and here's, we see the heart of our Lord. Come and you will see. He, he spends, Jesus spends the day with Andrew and the future Apostle John. They are so Fired up to spend just one day with the Lord, Andrew quickly goes and gets Simon, his brother, who also is in the area. Now, here's the thing I didn't catch. This is not taking place up in Galilee around the nets. My view had always been that kind of Peter was this guy that was kind of a ruffian that wasn't that much interested in spiritual things. But that would not seemingly be the case. John and Andrew were already disciples of John the Baptist, very caught up in this messianic movement. And evidently, Simon also was very excited. Because it didn't take much to get him to say, Come and see Jesus! Jesus says, Hey! You're a big fella. I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to call you Rocky. You don't forgive, forget somebody that gives you a nickname right on the spot the first time they see you. Now, this is not where they are called to be apostles. It's not even where they're called to be disciples of Jesus. This is simply the first time they meet. Now, they meet the first time not on the shores of Galilee. They're meeting 75 miles away. What are the odds? This is not by chance. It is by God. And the impact of just one day spent with the Lord changed these men's lives. You know, true discipling relationships begin with friendship. I think a lot of people really want to shortcut what it takes to really make disciples. And right here, Jesus begins to make a disciple of Andrew and John by simply spending the day with them. Why is that important? Because most people, as they go through their lives, have lost trust in their fellow human beings. And yet, when Andrew and John saw the life of Jesus, heard the words of Jesus, and got to even be where he was staying, got into, to go to where he was staying, they go, wow, it really is the Messiah. 
And so we see right here why Jesus had a beginning impact on these men's lives. It's that he built trust in them so they could follow him. See, if you're going to be a disciple, you've got to find someone to disciple you who you believe is out for God's and your best interests. When you find that person and you know that person is rare, then you're going to go after that person. Now, as people who are trying to be like Jesus and we're trying to make disciples, a lot of times we want people to automatically give us their trust. That just isn't going to happen in this day and age. You're going to have to spend at least the day, and some people lost so much trust, you're going to take a couple weeks or months. No, I'm talking about Carlos. Amen. But once you do that, then you have someone who's willing to give you their heart. And they are willing to say, okay, teach me to be like Jesus. You know, two of the people that, that uh, Lena and I love dearly are DJ and Casey. Oh, yeah. You know, Jesus did not baptize John or Andrew. Elena and I did not baptize DJ or Casey. And yet they're two of our most precious disciples in Christ. They came looking to try to find the Spirit of God and a movement of God. And when they came out to visit us, we spent the whole weekend with them. They got to see our lives. They got to see our home. They stayed with us. And at that time, there began to be a bond. Now, as time went on and they moved on out from Ohio to be with us there in Portland, obviously we spent more and more time together. We walked together. And so greater trust came from spending greater time. The reason we don't have more impact with people is we're not spending the kind of time with them that allows them to trust us as we walk with the Lord. Are you with me right here, guys? We are very proud of DJ and Casey and believe that in a year's time, the Holy Spirit's going to be reduplicating what you see in this room in Manhattan. Is that exciting? Amen, church? So the beginning impact we see with Jesus was with friendship. Now let's see his multiplying impact. Let's go to another passage that... I know all of us have read. Now remember, the beginning of Jesus' ministry was his baptism. And so we read again in Mark chapter 1. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting net into the lake for their fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus says, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them... And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Then they went to Capernaum. Right here we see Jesus' baptism. Then we see right after his baptism, he goes out into the desert, the wilderness, for his 40 days of temptation. The next thing we read in verse 14 is, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee. Now we need to understand a little bit about the Gospels themselves. Three of the Gospels are called synoptic Gospels. They're basically using the text of Mark, which is the first Gospel, and they're adding to it. So the second Gospel, most likely, was Matthew. It's written primarily to Jews that they're trying to persuade to become believers. Why do we believe that? Because of the genealogy that's at the beginning of the book of Matthew. The third Gospel is Luke. Now, Luke's the detailed guy that's trying to collect all the information to make sure everybody's got everything not only straight, but all the extra things that maybe, quote, Mark had left out. So he's trying to fix everything on up for us. Now, he writes primarily to the Gentiles because not only is the book of Luke addressed to Theophilus, but his second book, the book of Acts, is addressed to Theophilus. And Theophilus is simply a literary device. The name means Theo, God, Philo, friend. So it's addressed to the friend of God. So any friend of God, it's addressed to, and prayerfully, we're all friends of God today. Amen, guys? So the book of Luke is to you. Now, the book of John is written last of all, and his is written in a non-chronological way 
that fills in different gaps and gives a different perspective of Jesus himself. And so right here, we find the broad stroke of the first gospel, Mark. And it talks about the beginning, his baptism. It talks about the temptation, and it talks about John the Baptist being put in prison. And we just kind of read on down. The next thing we read is, is the calling of Peter and Andrew, James and John. And we take it as that's pretty continuous. If you look at Matthew, you'll find the same. If you look at the book of John, you'll find something is added. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 3. I've never seen this before. In John 3.22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out in the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and the people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. Wow! What what an insight! Now, Mark goes, baptism, temptation, John in prison. John adds, he says, okay, baptism, temptation, but before John is put into prison... Jesus is preaching simultaneously with John the Baptist. And the way he spends his time is with his disciples baptizing. Now, this is not the apostles. The apostles aren't selected for a little while yet after he's put in prison. So these are the guys he's been personally making disciples of. Going on out. And he is this collection of disciples. And as as he's out in the Judean countryside, in the southern part of Israel, he's out there baptizing. Pretty good, huh? Look at chapter 4. Verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. Okay, right here we see, in fact, the multiplying impact. We see here is the first differentiation between the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus. John the Baptist kept personally baptizing people until he was put in prison. Jesus, yes, he at first is personally baptizing people. And he takes his guys on out with him to baptize. But after a while, he stops baptizing and makes sure that every one of his guys are fruitful. Is that awesome? And so in this sense, he's multiplying disciples and gaining and baptizing more disciples than his dear half-cousin, John the Baptist. Amen? Now, it's another very interesting thing. Go back to your Mark passage again. After Jesus is returning to Galilee, at that point, John's been put into prison. This is when he's walking by the Sea of Galilee... And he officially calls Andrew and Simon to become his followers. He's built a relationship at this point, And now he's going to lay it on the line. He says, come, follow me. And I'll make you a fisherman. He says, I'm going to give you a purpose for your life. And the guys got so fired up, they left immediately. He did the same to James and John. They were so fired up, they left their dad in the boat, and they just went following Jesus. Is that incredible, guys? And then look what it says in verse 21. They went to Capernaum. Well, this is very interesting. This is where Luke, who's the detailed guy, you remember, adds something else after the imprisonment. Now let's go to the book of Luke. We're trying to understand the multiplying impact. In Luke 3... We find that Jesus is baptized. At the beginning of Luke 4 is the temptations. Then we read in verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee. Okay, so that matches, that matches what we found there in Mark. Amen, guys? Jesus returned in in Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Now let's stop right there. Go all the way forward in chapter 4, verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum. Oh, baby. Something else happened that Luke felt like, man, we got to include this in my gospel. People need to know about this. Mark left it out, and I know Mark liked to be short, and some of us like to read short books, don't we? Amen? But right here, Luke adds an event. 
that he felt that was so profound that he takes several verses to explain it. Let's see what it was, because this is part of the multiplying impact, is it not? Verse 16, he went to Nazareth. Oh, well, that's, that's where he's from. Where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. It's good to know that Jesus went to church, amen? amen. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's owned me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now that was a cranking church service. Everybody knew this is the messianic scripture. And he says, hey, today it's fulfilled. Verse 22. All spoke well of him. Wouldn't you speak well of the Messiah? I mean, the Messiah that came to proclaim freedom for the prisoners? Wouldn't you be fired up about that? Could I have an amen on that? Amen. Recovery of sight for the blind? Doesn't that sound exciting? Releasing the oppressed? That sounds cranky to me. Particularly in their mindset of a Messiah that was going to, like David, free them from the Philistines. Jesus, the Messiah, was going to free them from the Romans. And so that's how they read that scripture. But they were very fired up for the Messiah. Well, now watch this. All spoke well of him and were amazed that his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's boy? They asked. She said to them, Surely will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do you hear in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum? I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Let's stop for a second. Right here, Jesus says, you know something? Let me explain the scripture to you a little bit better. He says, in Israel, during Elijah's time, there was a famine. And yet Elijah was not sent to any widow in Israel, but sent to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, a Gentile. Uh -oh. Verse 27. And there were not many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only name in the Syrian. There were a lot of people with leprosy inside of Israel. But God didn't send Elijah to all the people inside of Israel with leprosy. He sent him to a guy outside of Israel, a Gentile, and healed him of leprosy. Well, let's see how they... Pretty exciting, huh? Verse 28. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum. Wow! Mark, you left a little something out right there. Wow. Right here is, 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 is a staggering event in the life of Jesus. Most likely, Mark left it out because... Nothing happened positive in Nazareth. When Jesus went back to preach, at first, yeah, they all loved Jesus. But when Jesus laid it out, that as the Messiah, he had come to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, sight for the blind, and release the oppressed, not only of the Jew, but of the Gentile, they were furious. But right here we see from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he let people know his world vision. That as the Messiah, he had come to free both Jew and Gentile. Amen. A lot of us think that, well, as Jesus' ministry went on, the persecution began to heat up and it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then whammo, he gets killed at the end of his ministry. Let me tell you something. It heated up pretty hot right at the beginning. In his first sermon in his hometown, they said, hey, let's go out to the brow of the hill and let's kill you. <laughs> they hated the dreamer. They hated the dream. And they wanted to kill him from the beginning. Now, what is the multiplying impact? It's very simply this. There's got to be a vision given to people. Jesus gave from the beginning of his ministry a vision to change the world, both Jew and Gentile. He was hated for it. 
He was persecuted to the point of death. And yet it was this vision that he began to instill from the very beginning of his ministry. And then he lived out on a daily basis, walking around with his disciples. They made disciples and baptized them. He says, okay guys, it's your turn to make disciples and baptize them. And in that sense, there was a multiplying ministry. I've got to ask you a question. Do you have a vision to change the world? Every follower of Jesus Christ needs to embrace this vision. There are some that hate it because of the sacrifice that it's going to take in order to achieve it. Let me ask you a second one. Do you embrace the purpose that He's called us all to? Come follow me. And everybody says, Amen. And I'll make you a fisher of men. But if you're not a fisher of men, are you really following Jesus? Let's just bring it down here. How about it? This week, have you been sharing your faith every day? Did you have someone out for Bible talk? Do you have a friend on out today at church? Now, granted, there are going to be times we don't have a visitor out for Bible talk. We don't have a, a visitor out for church. But if it's your purpose, if this is what you're all about, it's not going to be very many times that you don't have someone out with you. Now, that may seem harsh. It may seem judgmental. And it's the teachings of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus means to be a fisher of men. For Peter and the gang, that fired them on up. They were sick and tired of messing with the stinking fish. Their day in and day out occupations. Boredom. And besides that, fish stink. And secondly, they weren't the greatest fishermen in the world either. Have you ever been tired of your life? Of the mundane? Then you need a purpose. Sadly, there are people that call themselves disciples that sit in church and attend every Sunday. And yet they have an emptiness because they're not about their purpose. You see, if we're going to embrace the dream, we have to have a beginning impact of making friends. And then we have to have a multiplying impact of a vision to change the world by putting our lives on the line with the purpose of being fishers of men. Thirdly, there is a selecting impact. Let's go back to Mark, since that's our short gospel. By chapter 3, in verse 13... Mark writes this. Now remember, Jesus has been preaching and teaching and baptizing for a while now. And we read this in verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boandres, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Right here, Mark says, after preaching and teaching, after offering a vision to all of his disciples, he called them those he wanted, and he appointed twelve of them, calling them apostles, or the literal translation of the Greek word is messengers. For what purpose? That they might be with him, so that he might send them out to preach. Now, let's see what Luke in the expanded version has to say. Luke chapter 6. Verse 12. Luke 6, verse 12. One of those days. Have you ever had one of those days? Yeah, it was one of those days. It was one of those days. Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Up to this point, we have no record of Jesus spending the whole night praying to God about any decision. Luke says, listen, this decision was so gigantic, so monumental. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, spends the entire night in prayer. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them. 
whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who's called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Wow. So Jesus prays all night. And the Bible says when the morning came, he calls his disciples to him. And he chose 12 of them. You know, a lot of us have this idea that the first 12 guys Jesus meets become his apostles. Not the case at all. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's walking with them. Quite some time has passed. John's in prison. This is after that particular time. And then the Lord puts my heart. It's time now to have a selecting impact. You're going to have to focus on a few. Can you imagine the scene? After praying all night, Jesus calls all his disciples to him. I don't know how many there were, but he was Jesus, so there's probably a lot of them. Amen, guys? And he says, I have come to launch the second part of my plan and my dream to change the world. I want to pour my life into a few of you because we all understand the issue. When you try to pour yourself into gobs of people, your impact is slight and it sometimes doesn't even have an impact. But Jesus understood the principle of focusing in on a few. Now sadly, to the hurried churchman and to the unspiritual mind, this can look like favoritism. But the way of Jesus was to focus in on a few people so we could have a maximum impact upon them and put himself into their heart. And so right here, it's very interesting. Number one, he stands up there and he explains that. And he says, okay, out of you, I choose Simon. This big Simon comes on out. Comes on, stands up here. Next, Andrew. Okay, I'm coming. James, John, they go, I knew we'd get chosen. And he goes on down the line and and all the guys are standing out front right there. So all the other disciples to see him. And Jesus says, listen, I've called these men to be with me. So I can send them out to preach. What do we learn? Well, number one, if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to focus in on a few. We've got to make some decisions on who we're going to pour time into. Number two. Our relationships need to have a fundamental purpose of being with them so we can send them out to preach. And number three, it's not by chance that he chose a group. See, he could have just said, okay, I'm just choosing Peter and I'll multiply through him. It would have worked from a geometric point of view. Peter could have baptized one guy who baptized another who baptized another. who baptized. He says, nope, we need a group. Say, so why do we need a group? Because a lot of times with an authority figure, you're really nice to them. You know what I'm talking about? But when you're with your peers, then your real self comes on out. That's called family. That's called family. You see, Jesus understood that he had to put men together. because he And, and, the, and the kinds of men that were here were just so different from each other. You've got Simon the Zealot who wanted to kill all the Romans. And you got Matthew, the traitor, who became a tax collector for the, the Romans. And he says, okay, you guys are going to be in the same group. And you're going to really love each other. You know, some, you get two guys like that loving each other, you go, it is God. It is God. And that is the testimony to this day about who Jesus' true disciples are. They're not the people that are most of like. On the contrary, it's the people that are most different that give glory to God when they love one another. And so when you look around the auditorium, it's great to see young people that are fired up in the Lord. Amen. Amen. And old people that are fired up in the Lord. It's great to see some some awesome college grads that, that, that went to some prestigious colleges. And then it's great to see some of the rest of us. It's great to see the white and the black and the Latin and the Asian love indiscriminately. And we know that because a lot of the mixed marriages that we see. (laughs) See, as disciples, we see no, no barriers between ourselves. Jesus went out of his way 
to find people that would irritate one another. (laughs) And he says, I want to form a group with you guys. Because if I can get you guys to love the Lord and love one another, it'll be a testimony this is all about God. Are you with me right here, guys? Now I got a question. Do you have a group that you're devoted to? Are you devoted to your Bible talk? Now, it's a loose analogy, your Bible talk leader being Jesus. That's a stretch for some of them. (laughs) But it's also a stretch for you being an apostle. Amen, guys? But that's the model that we have. And even though the Bible talk, you may find someone that's totally different than you. By the way they talk, way they dress, way they come across, just great you. You know, some, if you end up loving that person, it's a testimony to Jesus. But see, we've got to understand, this Bible talk is not all about being a group. This Bible talk is all about being together so that we can go out and preach. And it's too, too much the church is focused inwardly. Now, we need to take care of all the needs in the body. Amen? And as the family of God, that's got to be a priority. But we cannot neglect the fundamental reason that Jesus formed groups. The fundamental reason he formed groups is so he would be with them so that he could send them out to preach. And so you've got to ask yourself, how effective is your group? I bet it's about as effective as much as you love one another. When you're fired up about one another, you go, you've got to come to my Bible talks. It is awesome. I have an awesome Bible talk leader. It's incredible. You know, some of us have gotten to the point, we've been around the kingdom 10, 15, 20 years, and the Bible talk, well, it was a little long this week, and I just felt like you could use this scripture over here, this scripture over there. We have lost our sense of awe of God and His words. We have lost our sense of awe of these people that have sacrificed everything to be a part of that Bible talk in order to bring other people to Christ. And as disciples of Jesus, it's time to put aside our prejudices, To put aside our predispositions, to put aside who we are in the flesh, it's time to love Jesus by loving one another. Are you with me right here? And when you're fired up about God, when you're fired up about your Bible talk leader, when you're fired up about your Bible talk, let me tell you something. You're going to go, hey, you got to come. you got to see Jesus. Because see, that is what people see when they see a love, one, for another. You know, when Jesus chose the twelve, he also focused in on a few, Peter, James, and John. I think we've got to understand that the leaders in the church are not playing favorites when they focus in on a few. Quite the opposite. They're trying to be like Jesus. You've got to focus in on a few people if you're going to maximize your impact. Some of us, and in the church right here, we have a practice we call discipleship partners. And we try to have a discipling relationship. It begins with a kind of a teacher-student, because that's what disciple means, a student. So a teacher-student relationship or parent-child relationship, because they're babes in Christ. And then over time, it matures to more of an adult-adult relationship. But we all still need discipling. We still need people in our lives. Are you with me right here? And if you don't have discipling in your life, your life is going to tank. It's just going to get out there because we, we all are sinners. And left to our own devices, we're just going to go the way of our flesh. Now, some of us, the way of our flesh leads us to gross sins. For others, we become couch potato watching TV every night, being bored out of our gourds with our lives. And yet, we're at church on every Sunday. I'm a disciple. That is a bunch of baloney. That is not the kind of disciples that Jesus had following him. Next, there was a duplicating impact. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Remember, now he's walking with the twelve. There's, he's sending them out to preach. Verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go! I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Ever felt that way? You know, right here, we see a duplicating impact. Jesus already had the twelve. And now he appoints 72 others that he's going to send on ahead of him. Now, nothing in the scriptures is by chance. 
Whenever Jesus sent out disciples, he always sent them out two by two. And you know why? So we wouldn't chicken out. <laughs> Even the apostles were paired two by two. Now think about this for a second. Jesus has 12, and that number's not by chance. In the Old Testament, Israel came from the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes. That's what Israel was composed of. Jesus was trying to build the new Israel, and so it's not by chance he chooses the 12 apostles, the 12 messengers, to build spiritual Israel on. This number 72 is likewise not a chance number. If you pair up the 12 apostles, you have how many pairs? Six. Six in the 72 goes what? Twelve. And so you've got the two pairings having a group of 12 guys to themselves perfectly reduplicating the ministry of Jesus. Are oh, you seeing what I'm saying? You see, you're in a Bible talk right now. Yes, you're a babe in Christ, or yes, maybe you've been restored and you're a little bit weaker, but your goal is to become strong with the Lord, in love with that Bible talk, and so in time you reduplicate and you become a Bible talk leader. You see what I'm talking about right here? Now it's exciting. Look down at verse 17. He sent them all out and says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So there was accountability. Amen, guys? He replied, Jesus talking, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, this is, this is an exciting scripture right here. The 72 come back and they are pumped. I mean, so many people were open. Jesus says, you know something, guys? I'm fired up for you. I saw Satan Fall like lightning. It was incredible, the impact you had. But Jesus, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Why? Because it's not every day you see Satan fall like lightning. Sometimes Jesus springs up like, I mean, Satan springs up like lightning. And you get struck by lightning. But see, a lot of disciples, their joy is based simply upon their, quote, performance, their impact. And right here, Jesus says, hey, I am so fired up too that Satan fell like lightning. But you need to rejoice that your names are written in heaven, that you are saved. Now think about that. Now for a lot of us, we say, well, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be saved. No, according to the scriptures, you are saved. You know, it's hard to just keep a frown when you go, I am saved. <laughs> I mean, if you say, I'm saved, I mean, you're fired up. Let's try it right now. I'm saved. Yeah, some of you guys smile for the first time. Amen. That's good. That's awesome. Now, to remind you of that, now it's going to be a good day. Amen, guys? Look at this. Verse 21. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, he was so fired up. Look at verse 23. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but didn't see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. He says, you see the multiplication of disciples. You see the multiplication of leaders upon which spiritual Israel is going to be built. Prophets and kings have longed to hear what you hear. Have longed to see what you see. You know, one thing that's common to man is a sense of... Of a lack of gratitude and taking things for granted. You know, we are so blessed about what the Holy Spirit has done in the church here. In five months' time, with just a mission team of 42 people, we've seen 35 people baptized into Christ. Is that incredible? We've seen 38 people restored. And it was awesome seeing Lupe restored today. Amen, guys? And 55 people place membership, and a lot of them are really being restored. Amen. I mean, it's, I mean, it's incredible what the Holy Spirit is doing. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, and the ears that hear what you hear, because prophets and kings have longed to see what you see and hear what you hear. The kingdom is here. You should be fired up. Amen, church? 
That is the duplicating impact. Let's go to world impact. Go to Matthew chapter 28. After the resurrection, we read in verse 16. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. Once more, Jesus was crucified and resurrected in Jerusalem. But he tells them to meet him in Galilee. Why? Because that's where they were originally called. And he wanted them to remember their original calling. Because we could forget the initial decision we made when we left everything to follow Jesus. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Right here, Jesus says, Hey, I've been with you three years. I'm going back to the Father. Now you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. What was the last thing he commanded them? Go and make disciples of all nations. This is the great commission. You know, the exciting thing is that in 30 years' time, Jesus' vision to change the world, to impact both Jews and Gentiles around the world, becomes a reality. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians 1 and verse 6, Paul writes this in about 60, 62 A.D. So about 30 years after Jesus ascends to heaven. In verse 6 he says, All over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it, and understood God's grace in all its truth. Is that fire you want up right there? Now look at verse 23. This is, this is incredible. This is the gospel that you heard. And that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Every living creature had heard about Jesus Christ. In 30 years' time, a generation. You know, I believe with all of my heart, not only can it be done, but it has to be done. Let's go back just a couple more scriptures. Let's go back to Psalm 126. Come on, you know, the first part of the psalm talks about the dream to go back to Zion. The second part of the psalm talks about the price. In verse 4, Psalm 126. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Gev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. You know, the picture here is, is beautiful. It talks about a great harvest. And it says, this farmer went out and he loved his land so much that as he cast out the seed, literally the tears came from his eyes and off of his cheeks and fell on the soil and the seed, watering it to produce a harvest. The price of the dream is tears. Tears. That's what it takes to have a harvest of the world. The price, first of all, the tears of discipleship. Secondly, the tears of leadership. And thirdly, the tears of persecution. Turn to Luke 14. In Luke 14, in verse 25, it says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, his wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who doesn't carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Verse 33. In the same way, any of you who doesn't give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. I think Jesus was pretty clear right here. You know, what's interesting, in verse 25 it says, large crowds are traveling. Well, I thought Jesus wanted to impact the world. Jesus was not after large crowds. Jesus was after True disciples. People that were totally sold out. People who loved God and His kingdom more than their father and their mother. Wife or husband. Girlfriend or boyfriend. 
brother, sister, son, daughter, or even themselves. Any person that came before Jesus and His kingdom was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. He says, you got to deny yourself. You can't live for yourself. you got to take up your cross daily for Jesus. Anyone who doesn't live the life of a disciple Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, 24-7 is not a disciple of Jesus. He says, you've got to be willing to give up everything or you cannot be my disciple. You know, I've got to ask you right now, how badly do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? How badly? You know, I remember when I played football in high school, we didn't have a very good football team senior year. Our, our team went three and five. And uh, we didn't score that many touchdowns. But they did have a cheer after they scored a touchdown. The cheer was something to the effect, Are you satisfied? And the crowd would go, Oh no! Now we didn't hear that very often. <laughs> but John, i got to ask you some question. Are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? Is your heart one where I want to be a disciple? Where you seek out discipling? Because you love God. And you sense the need for purpose in your life. Are you satisfied with your Bible talk? And the love you have for the fellow members? Are you satisfied? With your efforts to go out and invite other people to church and Bible talk. Not just in casual invitations, but like Jesus, to spend the day with them so you can win their trust and win their hearts. You know, last weekend, my my little sister called me on Saturday and she says, Mom suffered a heart attack. Wow. Now, my mom's 79, but she's been in awesome health. My dad's 79. He's been in awesome health. When that hit me, I had a lot of things I thought were worrying me, that I thought were pressures, I thought were really like mega problems. They were nothing. All I could think about was my mom, because she's not a disciple. She's she's never been baptized. I've studied with her light and darkness twice and turned back. When I heard that, I just got frightened. I got frightened. Because she's not in a right relationship with God. So on Monday, Monday night I flew on down, spent Tuesday, came back Wednesday. But, I mean, it was just great to be with my mom and just to hug her and to be with her. Because I understand, if if I'm not with her, she's not going to hear the truth. You know, even though I have a great passion for my mom and the fact that she's lost... And I sense her mortality. You know, everybody is somebody's mom. Everybody's somebody's dad. Everybody's somebody's son. Everybody's somebody's daughter. Everybody's somebody's sister. Everybody's somebody's brother. And though we may not feel the emotional connection because they're not blood family, their need for Jesus is the same. Yeah, you know, i never forget. I, I, I got on down there and when I had to leave on Wednesday morning, my mom came on out and she was just standing there. And I just teared up. Yeah, I, I was going to miss her. But I teared up and I thought in my back of my mind, is this the last time I get to see my mom? When was the last time you cried over the lostness of your physical family? When was the last time you cried all over the lostness of the people at your workplace? Your neighborhood, your high school, your college class. Let me tell you something. The thoughts about my mom have not left me. And all my problems have paled because I want my mom in heaven. You know, I've got to ask you, are you willing to cry the tears of discipleship? Turn to John 12. In John 12, Jesus says in verse 24, I tell you the truth, 
Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life loses it. Well, the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He says, when a grain of wheat dies, then, and only then, does it multiply. You see, in Christianity, victory, the multiplication of disciples, only occurs through being a loser. Now we hate being a loser. You know, that's about the most attractive thing you can say to somebody. You're a loser. You look like a loser. You wear loser clothes. And we hate it. We we don't want to be a loser. And a lot of us even try to be cool Christians. That's a contradiction. Christians are weird. Christians are not cool. Christians are losers. Maybe that's why you're not a very good one. You want to be cool. You hate being weird and you hate being a loser. Let me tell you something. Only when you are a loser and you die to your life can you multiply your life into other people. That's what it takes to be and have the tears of leadership. You know, a brother and sister that, that Elaine and I have just come to love with all of our heart is Marty and Kathy Wooten. You talk about people that kind of limped into our fellowship. Some people came wounded. These key people came in bloody. Like their aorta was splitting out stuff. And um, we're very faithful to our, our, our D times. I mean, and I love it. I, I look forward to it. And one of the things that I've been so proud of them is just to, to see them just going against them, their flesh and wanting to die in order to multiply. Even this past week, Marty drove all the way from L.A. up to Bakersfield to lead a Bible talk for only two people. Some of us go, I don't know why I make it out City Angels Church out there in Montebello. After all, I got about half an hour, 45 minutes. Two people clear out in the cornfields of Bakersfields. He had to die in order to multiply. I appreciate Kathy. You know, when all the heck broke loose in our former fellowship, it was tough on Kathy. She felt, and I, I could relate, like she lost all of her friends. And so what did she do? She started collecting horses. She thought those made better friends than people. Wow. And Kathy's quite a writer. She's been in different events and things. And, but the thing that was awesome is that as she's come to City of Angels Church and as she's gotten close to the Lord, she told us last week, she says, you know something? I've got to start devoting myself to people and not to my horses. Now, it's not a sin to love a horse. But you know what she did? She gave three of her horses to the Boy Scouts who sell and raise money. See, it's one thing to say, hey, I'm going to be a sold-out disciple. It's quite another to start simplifying your life and doing something about it. There are a lot of people in here that are struggling as disciples because you refuse to die. That's why you're not multiplying. That's why you're not happy. Until you start dying to yourself. Until you start saying, listen, I'm going to be a loser and I'm going to love it. (laughs) Until you start acting upon that, you're going to be a very unhappy Christian. See, these two have the tears of leadership. Finally, there's the tears of persecution. We'll close with this in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24 and verse 1, near the end of the ministry of Jesus, we read, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him and called his attention to its buildings. Do you see these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So Jesus, right here at the end of his ministry, goes to the temple area of Jerusalem. He says, hey, there's going to be a day that all the stones of the temple building will be cast down. And we all know that happened in 70 A.D. when the future emperor of Rome, Titus, just ransacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. 
So that really did happen. Now look at what he says is going to happen after he sends out the apostles in about 30 AD. Verse 9. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Well, the good news is, all nations will have heard of them. Amen? You know, you can't hate somebody you don't know. See, they knew about these apostle guys. That's why they hated them. The bad news is, they're going to persecute and kill them. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray each other and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. You know, a lot of us are, we're taken aback when we see brothers and sisters just fall away from God. And it somehow destroys our faith. In a way, it confirms the prophecy of Jesus. Jesus said, before the temple will fall, people are going to leave the Lord. Not only are they going to leave the Lord, they're going to betray each other. They're going to hate those that continue to follow Jesus. Verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Wow! The love of most will grow cold? That's what Jesus said. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. In this gospel, the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The end isn't the second coming. The end is... The destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Jesus prophesied, and Jesus is never wrong, amen guys? That the world would be evangelized before 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed. We need to get a conviction that this world can be evangelized in a generation, but the price is going to be persecution. You're going to be hated. People are going to go on the internet and find out that we're called a cult. There's going to be things said about certain ones of us that will take us aback. And yet we have got to remain faithful to the end. The kind of commitment that Jesus calls for is unheard of in the denominational world. Jesus calls for every single follower of Christ to follow to the death. We think that's only for the Muslim extremists. And we look down at them. Man, I can't believe those crazy Muslims dying for their faith. They're scary. That's the kind of scary true disciples that Jesus need to be. It's the gates of hell will not prevail. You know, the challenge before us, I think, is very clear. The price is high. Tears of discipleship, tears of leadership, tears of persecution. You know, my vision for this church is a simple one. My vision is that collectively we will shed tears for a lost world filling up our baptistry. And those that we bring to see Jesus will be baptized in our tears. And as they are baptized, the tears will overflow the baptistries and join the overflowing baptistries in places like Honolulu and Hilo and Kiev and Chicago and Phoenix. And together the tears will mingle into a life-giving flood of tears that will encircle the world in this generation, baptizing the entire planet and bringing the message of Jesus to the world in this generation. Thank you and God bless.